After putting a ton of time and love into a project, the last thing you want to do is code it with something that might potentially be harmful to your friends, family, or client that it's going to. Now, it's 2020 and I can go look at pictures from Mars from a robot that was taken there, but what it's okay to set your food on is still a really confusing topic, which is crazy. So I'm going to try to lend a little bit of clarification to the topic for you. I've got a couple really common products here, Plano laminated wood cutting board and some charcuterie boards. This clearly by the shape, you know, is made for serving, not for cutting. This looks like it could be a cutting board. And on the videos I've done on epoxy cutting boards, the question I get a lot is, can you cut on it? Is epoxy food safe, et cetera? Well, um, I'm gonna wanna knock this out quick as far as cutting on epoxy. You know, I don't want to experiment on this thing. I've got a lot of time into it. So I just took an off cut I have and coated this with tabletop epoxy from Total Boat. And uh, we're going to see what happens when you take a knife to it a bunch, like if you were cutting stuff. So as you already see, and to answer a really obvious question, did it, does it scratch? Yes, it does. Let's do a blue glove test though. No, it's kind of hard to see, but if you compare the fingers, yes, that is epoxy dust. So it did flake out a bunch of dust that yes, would end up in your food. So can you cut on an epoxy board? Well, I mean, obviously, I just did it. It's a free country. You can cash out your bank account, burn all the cash. If you want to, you can watch a schmuck on the internet in his garage and think you're an expert on a topic after that. You can do whatever you want, but should you? Should you do this? Well, I'm not a fan of cutting boards that look like garbage, so I wouldn't because this is going to lose all of its luster and beauty as soon as you do that. So, you know cut on something else, throw it on here to serve with because it looks pretty. But should, should is a much tougher question and we're gonna dive into that. Now, fair warning, this part's gonna be pretty boring because I don't know how or don't care to take the time to figure out how to make it interesting. You pick which one, but should be good information that explains it to you. So to answer, you know, should you cut on epoxy, like is that actually gonna hurt you? And also what is it safe to coat your cutting board, salad bowls, et cetera, with what is a food safe finish? Is everything food safe? Is nothing food safe, et cetera. So I put on my law school grad hat and dove into the um, chapter 21 of the CFR, which is the Code of Federal, Federal Regulations, specifically chapter or section 175, which deals with food additives. Now, before we dive into that too deep, what I'm gonna do is give you a few definitions. So when I say certain things, we're all on the same page about what those terms mean. The first is food grade. So something is food grade when it is fit for human consumption. So that means you can eat it. So an apple, it's food grade, it's food. Um, mineral oil is food grade. It's actually a petroleum product. It's been used as a laxative for a long time. It's also used to coat uh, wood to offer some degree of minimal protection, but it's food grade. You can ingest it. it. It's an additive that can be put in things. Olive oil, you know, clearly food grade. Wouldn't want to use something like that in a cutting board though, because it can go rancid at room temperature. That's food grade, something that is actually edible. Food safe means something that comes into contact with food that's safe with it. Then you also have indirect or safe for indirect food contact. Things that are safe for indirect food contact is stuff like the labels that's on the outside of packaging or adhesives used in packaging materials to seal packages that food is stored in. So, you know, there might be some indirect food contact with those things. So the idea is, you know, it's not going to be on there for very long. So you're not very worried about transfer or contamination from whatever that substance is into the food and it becoming an additive. However, of course, there are some things that, you know, is clearly not safe for that. Um, uranium, arsenic, uh, think of anything else. Pineapples, you know, clearly you don't want that touching anything you're going to eat. So those things should definitely not be on the outside even of a food package because there's a good likelihood of contact and contamination. So 
And then we also have um, food additives, right? Indirect food additives. So an indirect food additive is things that may be added or not may as in allowed, but may as in possibly could be added into a food through contact. And section 175 of 21 of the Code of Federal Regulations goes over all the allowable indirect food additives, which are basically things that can be, that are safe to be in a container, et cetera, that food is gonna have contact with. Now, it's very important to know that the FDA does not approve these kind of products. So there isn't an FDA approved wood finish. Um, all they do as an administrative work agency is regulate products. And in order for something to be deemed, you know, safe as far as section 175 it goes of 21 of CFR is that there's two steps. One, everything in it has to be approved on all the components of whatever that additive is. So that finish, that sealer, that container has to be on the okay list. And that's what 175 is, is a giant okay list of, hey, these things we've decided are okay. And it covers resins and epoxies and oils, etc. Check it out if you're really interested and a lot of chemical dryers and stuff like that. Um, so that's step one, All, you can only use things on that list. Step two is every batch of product that's created has to be tested depending on the circumstances in which it's intended to be used. So if you're talking about just um, room temperature food contact, then there's a table that breaks in. Okay, for room, room temperature food contact, then you have to be, you know, submerge this in distilled water at 120 degrees for seven hours or 24 hours, and then you test that water, and it's allowed to have so many parts per million of these components from those things. And so long as it's within the thresholds, then it's okay. If it's something that's supposed to be rated, say, for oven contact, then there's higher temperatures and times, whether it's for acidic food or non-acidic food or solvents, because acids are, are types of solvents, etc. So step one, you can only use the okay things in your product. Step two is every batch of product, you have to test it in accordance with these guidelines and make sure that everything stays cool. Well, um, as you can imagine, that's fairly expensive and gonna be really arduous to test every batch of product that goes out to make sure it's all good in that range. And um, wood finish companies just, they don't do that. And understandably they don't do that because the market of, you know, if, this is selling wood finish. The amount of wood finish that's going on products intended for food contact is probably like that. So why spend all the money on this much product for a market that's like this? So that's when we get into certain disclaimers on products like this one, which uh, is General Finish's Salad Bowl Finish. And this is often touted as a, you know, hey, if you're not sure you can use this for sure, why can we use this for sure? Because right here it says a non-toxic when cured finish. So, hey, when it's cured, it's non-toxic. Um, but there's been several guys who've done um, some really elegant um, articles that have dug into section 175 and looked, looked at this statement. And what they concluded is that pretty much every component used in common wood finishes, including the uh, metallic dryers and solvents, etc., cetera, in unpigmented, that's a caveat, in unpigment, unpigmented finishes are on that okay list. So the stuff in this, um, when cured, it's safe. They're all on the okay list, just like this stuff, we got armor seal and high performance top coat. There, this is a, a varnish oil poly blend. This is just a polyurethane. Allegedly, all the stuff in here, I haven't tested it, all, all the stuff that most finished companies use are all on that okay list. So there's nothing in here that the FDA says you can't use that could potentially be a food contact. Now, the uncertainty lies in okay, but they don't test every batch of this for how much leaches out. So does it leach out? Well, the stuff that's actually harmful um, as part of the curing process, 
it, it cures it and it evaporate or evaporates and it's and it's just gone or it changes its state and now it's now it's a solid so it, it can't leach so that's where the idea where anything that's unpigmented um, is safe so same can probably said for this which I like to use halcyon clear which is a varnished polyurethane however is rugged amber because this is water-based and not oil-based the color isn't coming from um, you know linseed or flaxseed oil or something this is actually pigmented to get that amber so that pigment mm, pigments are on covered in that list they may or may not be food safe that's a different list and a whole other thing because there's so many ways to get pigments and add pigments to finish so this a eh, little riskier to use for food contact um, this paint well uh, it's blue as you can see from what I spilled pigmented so probably want to stay away from that so yeah almost anything you want to put uh, any finish you have that's unpigmented for wood when it's cured not dry but when it's cured which is very different and you can find the cure time like all kinds of other fantastic information probably right there on the back of the can this will tell you that you know how you can recode it within a couple hours but that it cures in like 30 days that's pretty normal three to four weeks and if any if your container doesn't say then give it 30 days almost everything cures in 30 days and you're safe maybe of course I also get some of the hesitation though where you might be like yeah but I wouldn't drink this and I don't want to put this stuff in my body in an uncured state so who cares if it's cured or not I don't want my food touching something that I wouldn't eat or drink because um, I'm gonna eat or drink the stuff that touches that well I mean, I totally get that, but I think that logic breaks down pretty quick unless you routinely eat wood, metal, and plastic. Because um, I have wood cutting boards, uh, I have plastic cutting boards, all of my pans are metal. Um, so yeah, my food, my food touches all that stuff. Ceramic, I wouldn't eat ceramic, but I eat off ceramic plates and plastic plates. So yeah, I think that kind of breaks down the idea is when it's cured, is it safe or not? And Theory is, yeah, um, all that stuff leaves, evaporates, etc. Now, if you're hesitant and you want to be overly cautious and just stay away from that stuff or anything that might be okay as an indirect food add additive but isn't tested every batch, so you don't know the leaching amounts, etc., and you just want to be safer, I totally get that. So, the best way to be safe is instead of using something that might be okay as an indirect food additive, like the stuff in our salad bowl finish to use things that are food grade so they're safe for human consumption that is also okay as a finish this can of shellac sort of falls in that category i say sort of because it has shellac which is um, food safe you can eat shellac it's a natural product from the lac bug and if you've ever eaten fruit from the grocery store it was probably sprayed in shellac if you've ever taken a time release time release capsule um, that's made out of shellac etc but to help this dry and also to suspend it and emulsify it so it can be spread. This has ethanol, not something you want to drink, isopropanol, methyl isobutyl ketone. You don't want those things in your system, but you know what those, all those do? They all evaporate. Um, the only thing that you're left with, oh, and it has water too, which also evaporates. Uh, so the only thing you're left with is the shellac, which is safe, so this is probably okay. However, shellac is safe. What about the stuff on here that's not? Well, that's okay. What you can do is buy shellac flakes and then just make your own shellac by mixing it with denatured alcohol. Denatured alcohol, again, something you wouldn't want to ingest. However, if you've ever worked with denatured alcohol, you know the handy thing about it is how quickly it evaporates and it's all gone. So use shellac suspended in denatured alcohol. However, I get it. You're still using some denatured alcohol, which may be an indirect food additive. You want to stay away from that. Cool. Another alternative, this is Mylan's Finish Food Safe or Oil, which is their take on a um, paraffin oil or mineral oil, um, just white oil basically, which is food grade. Um, this is Howard's Butcher Block Conditioner. I use this uh, a, a lot to um, finish my cutting board products as well as to just um, to be the only finish, but also use really like to use this to revive it because I don't like to re-oil with mineral oil or anything. Um, then this is just food grade mineral oil and natural waxes so again food grade 
Another one I haven't tried yet is Mahoney's, this oil wax finish, which is a blend of beeswax, carinuba, another natural wax, and walnut oil. And here is um, the Mahoney's finish walnut oil which is a heat treated oil to make it polymerize, which all that really means is they heat this up. So instead of staying a liquid, it will actually turn into a solid and cure in your board. That's what polymerization is, which is a big difference between walnut oil and whatever kind of mineral oil you want to use. Mineral oil is very commonly used just because everyone knows it's food grade, so therefore it's safe for food, food safe. Again, food grade, food safe, different terms, but bear with me. Um, but one of the downsides of using mineral oil, and I haven't tried this particular brand yet, uh, Mylan, they provide this to me, I'm gonna play with it. So just my experience with Mylan products, this probably won't fall prey to the issue mineral oil normally does, which is that mineral oil is a non-curing finish. It doesn't polymerize, it doesn't turn into a solid, which is why um, if you've had a cutting board that's been soaked in mineral oil, which is very common, um, then for quite a while it's still it's sticky and when you have to like wipe and wipe and wipe and wipe and wipe it off so that you can touch it and not have oil on your hands well guess what by the time you've you've done that and you pick it up and you can touch it and there's no oil on your hands that's not because it's cured that's just because you've removed the oil so now the wood is no longer protected so what's it doing for you not much so if you're tired of having oil stains or not stains but you know oil marks on your counters table etc all over the place, then um, maybe get away from using mineral oil and go to something that polymerizes, or, and a good way to do that is to use wax. So kind of like the Howards um, here, I have quite a few friends who do cutting boards, and what they do is make their own finish, commonly called board butter, which is just a combination of mineral oil and beeswax. You, you know, bring it to a, a simmer, add the beeswax, so it melts, turns into one, then you have a solid, and they, because of the wax so that keeps your mineral oil from staying as oily and beeswax by itself can be kind of tough to mess with because it's so solid so the mineral oil helps you uh, buff in that beeswax which is kind of the same idea as this so just to uh, say the same thing again if you're hesitant about you know using something that's probably okay for food but it has some things that are gonna go away um, that the FDA says is cool and you definitely want to stay away from things that are not touted in that other category of stuff I just moved. But according to 21 CFR 175, I mean, should be totally safe for food. Just companies understandably don't spend all the money in testing to uh, be able to make those statements. You, know, you can totally use that. If you're not comfortable with those options, then just stick with something that is food grade. And yeah, because if you can eat it, for sure you can put it on your wood products that you're gonna put your food onto without any concerns. Now one thing I didn't talk about that anyone who's done very much learning or reading about finishes has heard of is film finish or non-film finish. Non-film finish being, you know, kind of your oils that just penetrate and don't build a film on the wood and harden or cure inside the wood. Film finishes being, you know, more of your Danish oil, your polyurethanes, paints, etc., that just build a film on top of the surface. Idea being you wanna use a non-film finish because it's gonna soak into the wood, whereas if you use a film finish and you cut on it, you're gonna break off chips and flakes. Well, that um, categorization does serve a very useful purpose, but it's kind of counterintuitive, be or not entirely the whole story, because even non-film finishes that soak into the wood sometimes do still generate a film, and then, you know, a lot of the film finishes we do do still penetrate the wood. So to say it, it's either or isn't entirely true, almost all of them, there's some degree of both. And there is definitely some credence to the idea of, you know, you definitely don't wanna build up a really thick, heavy finish on something that's intended to be cut on because yeah, you can definitely create flakes. However, if you accept the idea that once cured, these finishes don't have anything that's non-toxic on them and you're not building up a heavy film. Like all the times I've used general finishes, the first coat I put in pretty well entirely sucks into the wood and it's not till my third or fourth coat that I'm really starting to build a film. So I would be comfortable doing, you know, one or maybe two coats, you know, stopping before I see it start to build and letting this soak in and just penetrate into the wood. And, um, 
that be the finish. One advantage of that over some of the other finishes is all these more food grade, you know, things that are safe for human consumption, oils and whatnot, is even if they cure, they tend to wear out. They don't have the same type of water resistance and they just don't last as long. So they have to be reapplied. And most people these days just don't take care of um, their cutting boards and furnitures the way that they need to be in order to keep their luster. So if you want to give a product to someone and have it looking as good in a few months or a, a year or two as it does when they bought it, these products aren't going to do that unless they reapply them. Going a different way is going to offer that, but you do have to be very considerate of the way you do that um, and how you use those products to not create a chipping or flaking hazard. Of course, if my personal take, this is just my own opinion, if I was going to, you know, try something like Armor Seal or the Halcyon that I like to use on something that I intend to cut with, that would be something only for personal use. Um, I wouldn't be comfortable with the liability created by using that as a product to sell just uh, because I have been to law school and spent three years reading lawsuits. So I want to minimize the risk as much as possible. So if there ever is somehow any question, I want to be able to point to a product and say, hey, it's all food grade stuff. So I'm not doing anything that um, has a question associated with it. Even if the answer is probably fine, I don't want there to even be a question. I want the answer to be, yes, it is fine, not well, it's probably fine. Some people might think it's not, but it probably is. Just to be, uh, just because I'm risk averse. But that's me. I'm just trying to throw information that I've gleaned from my research at you to try to, you know, offer some clarification. If you made it this far in the video, you clearly like having your questions answered and learning new things, which is something I really enjoy. But if you also like learning new things from people that present much better than I do, you should consider becoming a member of Skillshare, the sponsor of this video. When I first started my channel, this is, I'd never done any type of videography or video editing or much work with a camera before at all and signed up to be a member of Skillshare and took some classes on just those things, photography, lighting, videography, how to use camera basics 101, as well as some video editing classes because I'd never touched Final Cut before and it really helped jumpstart my knowledge and get me going. But if those things are of interest to you, they have classes over a broad range of to topics from illustration, photography, videography, like I talked about, design, cooking, crafting. If you can think of it, there's probably a fantastic presenter on their site that has a class that you can take. Now, if that sounds interesting to you, and I don't know why it wouldn't, then make sure you're one of the first thousand people to click the link below and get your two free months of Skillshare. And after your two months run out, there's no obligation if you don't want to continue. But if you do, it's less than $10 a month to have access to that wealth of training to learn new skills, explore new topics, and you know maybe start working into something you never had before to just satisfy your own interest or have the possibility of creating new opportunities for yourself with the new talents and skills that you can learn. Anyway, I hope you did learn something from this video, were inspired or at least entertained. Hopefully I brought some clarity to this very confusing topic. And until next time, make time to make something.